right, welcome to your AP Statistics chapter on the standard deviation as a ruler and the normal model. Now, one of the nice things about categorical data is we can move from frequencies to relative frequencies or percents to put data from two different groups on the same scale, even if they don't have the same sample size. One nice thing about quantitative data is we can do the same thing by um, converting the observations in the original distributions into standard deviation units. And so an observation with a larger standard deviation is farther above its mean standard deviation than one with a, a smaller z-score or, or number of standard deviations um, even if they're on completely different scales. So for instance, that's how colleges and universities have historically been able to use ACT and SAT scores. They're on very different scales, but they can come up, uh, they can standardize the scores and come up with equivalent performances. So the trick to doing this, much like using percents, is to use standard deviations as our rulers. So the way we standardize with z-scores is we compare individual data to their mean relative to the standard deviation using the following formula. The z-score is equal to an observation minus the mean over the standard deviation. Since we're talking about sample results, it would be x minus x bar over s. We call these values standardized scores or z-scores, and they mean the number of standard deviations above or below the mean. They have no units because we've divided those out. Like I said, it measures the distance and the direction um, of each data value above the mean or below the mean. If it's a positive z-score, it's above the mean. If it's a negative z-score, it's below the mean, which is convenient. Makes it pretty easy to interpret. So what are the benefits of standardizing? Um, they've, the original values, like I said, have been um, standardized, and that makes us able to compare values that are measured on different scales with different units or from different populations. So it works for quantitative data, much like relative frequencies work for um, categorical or qualitative data. All right, just to kind of talk about what we're doing, when we subtract the mean from each of the observations, we're shifting the data. We're moving the mean to zero, okay? Um, so just a few notes on shifting data in, in general. Adding or subtracting a constant amount to each value just adds or subtract the same constant to or from the mean. This is true for the median and other measures of position also. So that's nice, okay? It's very intuitive. In general, adding a constant to every data value adds the same constant to the measures of centers and percentiles, but leaves the measures of spread unchanged. There's no greater distance even between like the smallest and largest value. The following histograms show a shift from men's actual weights to kilograms above what recommended weight. So here's their actual weight, and then they just subtract it off the number of kilograms that they should weigh, and here's the kilograms above recommended weight. So you've got some people who are below recommended weight, and then um, some people who are above recommended weight. One thing to note is that the shape does not sh change, the spread does not change, but certainly the center changes. When we divide or multiply all the data values by a constant value, that's called rescaling the data. And all measures of, of position, such as mean, median, percentiles, and measures of spread, such as the range, IQR, and standard deviation, are divided or multiplied by the same constant value. So um, if we multiply all those weights in kilograms, times um, the conversion factor to pounds that's going to rescale the data. So you can see it um, multiplies all of the values, and it also increases the spread, and that's by the same constant. Note again, the shape of the distribution does not change. All right, one thing we need to say um, is you can 
find z-scores and use them for any distribution at all. Here's one that's cl clearly skewed to the right, but it could be useful to find the z-score so you can compare, um, say, if this data happened to be from London and we wanted to compare with some data from New York, we could do that. So again, big concept is that changing the Z, uh, changing uh, observations into Z scores by standardizing them does not change the shape of the distribution. It does change the center um, to make the mean zero, and it does um, change the spread by making the standard deviation one. So one thing we're interested in is what's considered a big Z score. Um, it gives us an indication of how unusual value is because it tells us how far away it is from the mean, from the average. So a, a data value that sits right on the mean is going to have a z-score of zero because it is no standard deviations above or below the mean. A z-score of one means one standard deviation above the mean. Negative one means one, uh, the data value is one standard deviation below the mean. How far from zero does a z-score have to be to be interesting or unusual? The larger the magnitude of a, of a z-score is, the more unusual it is. So the reason they put magnitude in there is a, an observation with a z-score of negative four is more um, unusual than one with a z-score of positive two because the negative four has a magnitude of four and the positive two has a magnitude of only positive two, even though two is greater than negative four. With the magnitudes, that relationship reverses. Most of the time when we use these scores, we're going to be um, using them with a model that we're going to use over and over in statistics. Now remember, you can find z-scores for um, observations in any distribution. Now, we're fixing to use some things about the normal model to be able to convert uh, z-scores to probabilities. These apply only to normal distributions. If you have a skewed distribution, you can't move beyond the z-scores. Okay, this uh, model that you can see right here is called the normal model, or maybe you've heard of bell-shaped curves. Um, normal models are appropriate for distributions whose shapes are unimodal and roughly symmetric. These uh, distributions provide a measure of how extreme a z-score is in terms of the z-scores. And this applies only um, to normal distributions. Typically, under a normal model, an observation that is more than two standard deviations away from the mean is considered unusual. It's potentially an outlier. You need to look at it. And an observation that is more than three standard deviations uh, away from the mean is definitely an outlier and could possibly be considered an extreme outlier. There is a normal model for every possible combination of mean and standard deviation. We write n for normal, and then in parentheses we put the value for the population mean and the population standard deviation um, sigma. Uh, we use Greek letters here because they are not summaries of data. They're part of a model, something that's conceptual, something we believe about the population. And whereas with, um, with um, samples and surveys, we have statistics. With populations, we have parameters. So anytime we're using Greek letters, those are our parameters, the true mean, the true standard deviation. Um, again, the analogous figures from um, summaries of data are called statistics, and they're written with Latin letters. When we standardize normal data, we still call the standardized score a z-value, and we write z equals x minus mu over sigma. The big thing that you need to know is that it's observation minus mean over standard deviation. Once we've standardized, we need only one model, and that is what's called the standard normal model, the normal model with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Remember, we can't use this for just any data set. It has to be one that's plausibly normal. Standardizing data does not change the distribution. You can still find the z-scores, you just can't calculate uh, probabilities based on norm normality if normality doesn't exist. 
So when we use the normal model, we are assuming the distribution is normal. We usually can't um, check this assumption in practice. It's awesome when they tell us that the data come from a normal population because then we can assume it. So, but if they don't, we need to check the condition. And uh, because you know, you're just dealing with a sample from a population and doesn't have to be perfectly normal. It needs to be nearly normal. The shape of the distribution should be unimodal and symmetric. And then um, we'll want to check that with a histogram or dot plot or stem plot if we are going to look for that unimodal and symmetric um, shape. Another cool plot is called the normal probability plot, and we'll explain that later. It linearizes normal data. So it, it's kind of a cool thing to check and pretty quick to, to draw um, on a, a response. Okay, the 68.95.99.7 rule, also known as the empirical rule. Normal models give us an idea of how extreme a value is by telling us how likely it is to find one that far from the mean. We can find these numbers precisely, which we will do next time, but until then, we will use a simple rule that tells us a lot about the normal model. It turns out that in a normal model, about 68% of the values fall within one standard deviation, 95% of the values within two standard deviations, and 99.7% fall within three standard deviations of the mean. Again, this is for normal models only. You cannot use it for other models. So what does this look like? Well, here we've got it, okay? This is our standard normal distribution. We have our zero here. If we go out to a z-score of negative one, up to a z-score of positive one, remember these are standard deviation units, that's gonna capture 68% of the data, the 68% right out the middle. One thing that we're going to use a lot also is the fact that there is 100% of the distribution under the curve, and so we can actually subtract to find the tail distributions, but we'll talk about that in a minute. If we go out two standard deviations below and above, that captures 95% of the data, and then three standard deviations below to three standard deviations above, that captures almost all 99.7% of the data. So the first three rules for working with normal models, just like many things in statistics, the first three rules are to make a picture. Um, when we have the data, make a histogram or dot plot or stem and leaf plot to check the nearly normal condition to make sure we can use the normal model to model the distribution. We'll also talk about that normal probability plot, which is pretty cool. All right, so let's look at our examples. Some IQ tests are standardized to a normal model with a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 16. Draw the model for these scores. Clearly label it showing what the 6895.99.7 rule predicts about the scores. All right, so we want to draw a picture that looks like this, but that is um, relevant to the current uh, mean and standard deviation. All right, so that means we're gonna have to figure out where those boundaries are gonna be that are one standard deviation below and above, two standard deviations below and above, and three standard deviations below, below and above. You can do this ahead of time. After you do this a couple of times, you might be able to jump straight to putting the mean in the middle and then working with the standard deviation from, from there. But since it's the first time, let's take it step by step. The middle 68% will be between 100 minus one standard deviation of 16, or 84, and 100 plus one standard deviation of 16 to 116. The middle 95% are going to be between 100 minus two times the standard deviation, so 100 minus 32, so 68, and 100 plus two times the standard deviation, so 132. And then the middle 99.7% will be between 100 minus three times the standard deviation, so 100 minus 48, 52, and 100 plus three times the standard deviation, so 148. All right, so now we're gonna use this information to complete a picture of this distribution. Now, don't get intimidated by um, having to draw normal, um, normal graphs. 
you need to practice this. Um, they don't have to be beautiful as long as I can tell you intended them to be bell shaped and they're roughly symmetric. You're good. All right. So we are looking at IQ scores. These are the um, distribution of the actual observations. We haven't standardized anything yet. So the mean is 100. And here we have our one standard deviation below, one standard deviation above, and that captures 68% of the observations. Um, if we go out another standard deviation, we go up another standard deviation that captures 95% of the IQ scores. And then if we go out our third standard deviation below and our third standard deviation above, we have captured our 99.7% of our observations. Okay, so I've got this little picture as a reference up here because we're going to use it to find um, all kinds of information. So for part B, it says, in what interval would you expect the central 95% of the IQs to be found? Well, we, we know exactly what that is. It's going to be from 68 to 132. We just determined that. All right. So about what percent of people should have IQ scores above 116? All right. So 116 is our upper bound for the middle 68%. All right. Earlier, I mentioned that we can use this information and the fact that 100% of observations are underneath the, the curve to figure out the um, areas of the tails or the percent of observations that lie in each in the tails. So collectively, in both the tail that's below 84 and above 116, there is 100% minus 68% or 32% total in both of these tails. Now, one of the definitions uh, or one of the characteristics, excuse me, not definitions, one of the characteristics of a normal model is that it needs to be symmetric. So um, since that's true, and these two tails start an equidistant from the center, then we know that half of that 32% is in the, is represented in this lower tail, the less than 84 tail, and half of that 32% is um over, represented over here in the above 116 tail. So that means about 16% of people should have IQ scores above 116. About what percent of people should have IQ scores between 68 and 84? Well, that's an interesting thing to consider because that's just a piece of a tail. See the 84 down to 68? So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out the area of the tail to the left of the 84. And then we're going to figure out the area to the left of the 68. If we subtract that smaller area from the larger area, we'll have the area of interest. So using the reasoning from the prior, prior problem, there should be about 16% of IQ scores lower than 84. And then since 68 is the lower endpoint for the 95%, um, range, there should be about half of 5%, so 2.5% lower than 68. So 16%, the large tail, minus 2.5%, the lower tail, gives us the, air, the percent that lie in this interesting shaped region right here. So 13.5% of the scores. At least what percent of people should have IQ scores above 132? Well, this is actually easier than the last problem. 132 is partners with 68. It's the upper bound of the 95% from the center. And so 2.5% would be above that since half of that 5% would be here and half of the 5% would be over on the other end. So about 2.5% of people should have IQ scores above 132. What IQ score would you consider to be unusually high? And you want to explain that. Well, we said two standard deviations away from the mean are potential outliers. Um, three standard deviations are considered extreme outliers. Um, so we'll go with the two standard deviations. That should qualify as unusually high. We want to work with positive two standard deviations above the mean because we're talking about unusually high IQ scores and not unusually low IQ scores. So 100 plus 2 times 16 is 132. 
I would consider an IQ over 132 to be unusually high because the observation is more than two standard deviations above the mean, um, and a normally distributed model is considered to be rare. Anything above um, three standard deviations of the mean is considered to be an extreme outlier. So right here, this first sentence is an explanation that um, tells me or tells the reader exactly what I think it, um, is, oops, tells the reader exactly what I think is a large score, okay, unusually large. Um, and then I've already given um, quantitative evidence of it. You want to show that work. Like if this were asked on the AP exam, you would want to show this 100 plus 2 times 16 is 132. And then you want to make sure you answer the question. You can't just put 132. And then you want to explain why that matters. So I would consider an IQ over 132, showed the work to show where I got it from, um, to be unusually high. And now because, okay, um, the what comes after the because has to link what I have found to what is conceptually true um, overall. So because any observation more than two standard deviations above the mean, okay, so not just in this case, but in all the cases in a normally distributed model, it's considered to be rare. Okay, so I have shown three things that are important here. First, I showed numerically how I found it. Then I declared that I think it is unusually high. And then I've stated why. Okay, I can't just show that and say, oh, I consider it to be unusually high and leave it to the reader to go, oh, yeah, they added two times the standard deviation. And this is a normal model. You need to connect those dots because any observation more than two standard deviations above the mean in a normally distributed model is considered to be rare. Okay, guys, that's it. Um, do your problems to try on your own. We will go over those in class tomorrow. Um, and then we will go on to looking at more ways we can use the normal model. So thank you for your attention. Have a great day and I will see you in class.